EPCO Educational Topic Number 22, Abnormal Labor. You may remember our patient, Labora Deliverage, from our APCO video number 11, Intrapartum Care. We follow Labora through a normal labor and delivery course in that video. In this video, Labora will experience abnormal labor. We will discuss how best to provide care for Labora and her fetus to optimize outcomes. The objectives of this video are to list and describe the causes and methods of evaluation of abnormal labor patterns, discuss fetal and maternal complications of abnormal labor, List indications and contraindications for oxytocin administration. Describe risks and benefits of trials of labor after cesarean delivery. And lastly, discuss strategies for emergency management of breech presentation, shoulder dystocia, and cord prolapse. Here is Labora entering labor and delivery in active labor. She is dilated to five centimeters. Let's start by talking about the three P's that contribute to a normal labor, the power, the passenger, and the passage. The power refers to uterine contractions. The uterus must produce strong, frequent contractions that will dilate the cervix and cause the fetus to descend down. Ideally, the uterus should contract three times in a 10 minute period. Here is a fetal heart rate tracing and remember that the top line is the fetal heart rate and the bottom line are the uterine contractions. This tracing shows 10 minutes of labora's labor and she has three contractions marked by the white arrows. The uterine contractions are usually monitored by an external tocometer, which does not give information about the strength of the contractions, just the timing. Let's check back on Labora. She was admitted to labor and delivery in active labor at 5 centimeters dilated, and she's been having regular painful contractions for 2 hours. Since she is a Gravita 1 para 0 in active labor, her cervix is expected to dilate at approximately 1.2 centimeters per hour. A multiparous patient in active labor should have progression of approximately 1.5 centimeters per hour. After two hours when we recheck Labora's cervix, it is unchanged and it is still 5 centimeters dilated. In order to assess the strength of the contractions, we place an intrauterine pressure catheter, or IUPC. This tracing is from an IUPC. The strength of the contraction is the amplitude of each wave. A Montevideo unit can be simply calculated by measuring the amplitude above the baseline for a 10 minute period and adding them together. Normal labor progress is usually associated with a Montevideo unit of greater than 200. Next, let's move on to the passenger. Ideally, the fetus is not too big and is in a good position for delivery. If the fetus has an estimated weight greater than 4,500 grams, the risk of shoulder dystocia and labor dystocia are greater. The fetal position is important as well, for ideally you want the fetus positioned in the optimal way to be able to fit through the pelvis. Let's review the bony landmarks of the fetal vertex. On vaginal examination, the diamond-shaped anterior fontanelle and the triangular-shaped posterior fontanelle can be palpated, as well as the sagittal suture. This photo has a better view of the triangular-shaped posterior fontanelle. We describe the fetal position in relationship to the fetal occiput and the maternal body. Here is a fetus in the occiput anterior position. Here is the posterior fontanelle, and the occiput is on the anterior part of the maternal body. This is the optimal position for delivery, for this has the smallest diameter that has to pass through the pelvis. This fetus is in the occiput posterior position. Note the posterior occiput and the anterior fontanelle. This fetus is in the occiput transverse position. Both the occiput posterior and occiput transverse positions have bigger diameters that need to fit through the pelvis. There are other possible presentations such as a compound presentation or face presentation which can all contribute to labor dystocia. Labor can be stalled before she reaches 10 centimeters dilated known as failure to progress or arrest of dilation or the patient can reach 10 centimeters and the fetus does not descend for delivery known as arrest of descent. The last of the three P's to discuss is passage. Maternal skeletal or soft tissue issues can obstruct the birth canal. Cephalopelvic disproportion refers to the conflict between the fetal head and the pelvic size. The pelvic bone shape or maternal soft tissue, most commonly excess adipose tissue, can contribute to labor dystocia. Let's get back to Labora. Remember that she was admitted at 5 centimeters dilated in active labor. At the time of a repeat sterile vaginal examination, she was still 5 centimeters dilated and we placed an intrauterine pressure catheter, and this demonstrated that her contractions were not strong enough. Augmentation refers to stimulation of uterine contractions. Amniotomy or rupturing of her amniotic membranes can enhance progress in the active phase. It may stimulate release of prostaglandins, which aid in augmenting the force of contractions, and also allows for the fetal head to be the dilating force. 
Oxytocin can also be given intravenously to strengthen contractions. The goal is to titrate the oxytocin so that the contractions are strong and frequent enough to produce cervical change in fetal descent, but not too strong to cause uterine tachycystole. Uterine tachycystole is defined as more than five contractions in 10 minutes over a 30 minute period. You perform an amniotomy and oxytocin is started for labora. Three hours later you check on her and she is happily 10 centimeters dilated and she starts pushing. Her second stage is slow but she continues to make progress and after 2.5 hours of pushing she delivers the fetal head and you realize that the anterior shoulder is stuck. This is a shoulder dystocia. Let's now switch gears to discuss shoulder dystocia. Shoulder dystocia can be a true obstetrical emergency. The baby's anterior shoulder is effectively caught behind the pubic symphysis, which is illustrated in white. It is important to remain calm and to know the steps to help deliver the shoulder. In general, there is about five minutes to deliver a well-oxygenated term infant. First and foremost, take steps to make sure that you have adequate nursing and obstetrical staff support. Start with McRoberts maneuver, which is hyperflexion and abduction of the hips. This can open up space that will enable the shoulder to be reduced. The next step is suprapubic pressure, which is pressure directed downward on the anterior shoulder. If these first two steps do not lead to delivery, then next try to deliver the posterior arm of the fetus. An episiotomy can be helpful at this point to open up space posteriorly. Additional steps for shoulder dystocia include the wood screw and Rubin maneuver, which are rotation of the fetus to reduce the shoulder. It can also be helpful to move the patient onto her hands and knees. In severe cases, intentional clavicular fracture can be performed, and the last option is to perform a Zavanelli procedure, which requires reversing the cardinal movements to labor and to flex the head back into the uterus and to perform a cesarean delivery. Brachial plexus injury rates with a shoulder dystocia range from 4 to 40 percent regardless of the maneuvers used to deliver the fetus. The second obstetrical emergency that we will now discuss is cord prolapse. This is when the umbilical cord descends in advance of the fetal presenting part. Here is the fetus and the blue umbilical cord that has prolapsed through the cervix. Cord prolapse occurs when 1. the fetus is not vertex, or 2. there is spontaneous rupture of membranes before the vertex is well engaged, or 3. there is iatrogenic artificial rupture of membranes before the vertex is well engaged. Cord prolapse is an emergency for the blood vessels in the umbilical cord are compressed. When this is recognized, the provider's hand must push the fetal head up so it does not further compress the cord, and the cord needs to be manually reduced back into the uterine cavity, and the patient needs to be brought back to the operating room for an immediate cesarean section. The hand needs to stay in place throughout this time until the baby is safely delivered. The last emergency that we will discuss is breech delivery. It is important to note that singleton breech presentations should be delivered by cesarean section. There may be situations, however, when cesarean section is not possible because of precipitous delivery or lack of operative resources. If this situation were to arise, the first thing is to call for assistance. Next, it's important to avoid any traction on the fetus for the goal is to avoid a fetal head extension which can make the delivery more difficult. Wait until the maternal efforts have resulted in the fetus being delivered to the level of the umbilicus. Suprapubic pressure can then be applied to promote flexion and descent of the fetal head. We will conclude Labora's journey into the world of abnormal labor with a discussion about women who have had a previous cesarean section. What if Labora had a history of cesarean section with her first pregnancy? There are three primary possible outcomes. She could have a successful trial of labor after cesarean, which is a vaginal birth after cesarean, or VBAC. This is the ideal option, for Labora will have decreased maternal morbidity and decreased risk of complications with future pregnancies. At a population level, more VBACs mean there is a decreased overall cesarean delivery rate. Our next preferred option would be a scheduled repeat low transverse cesarean section at 39 weeks. Our third preferred option is a failed trial of labor after cesarean and she still ultimately needs a cesarean delivery. This option has the highest rates of maternal morbidity with higher rates of bleeding and infection. It is important to weigh the risks and benefits when making these decisions with our patients. The benefits of a successful trial of labor after cesarean delivery are that you avoid surgery which leads to lower rates of hemorrhage, infection, and you'll have shorter recovery periods. In addition, there are decreased future abnormal placentation risks such as placenta previa or placenta accreta. Uterine rupture is the most feared complication of a trial of labor after cesarean. With a history of one low transverse cesarean section, the risk of uterine rupture is 0.7 to 0.9%. With a history of two low transverse cesarean sections, the risk of rupture is 0.9 to 1.8%. 
With a history of a classical cesarean section, the risk of uterine rupture is 10%. This high rupture risk is why these women should have a repeat cesarean delivery and not try to labor. When counseling patients who've had a low transverse cesarean section, different clinical factors have to be taken into account that either increase or decrease your probability of a successful VBAC. Having a history of a prior vaginal birth, or if she presents in spontaneous labor, both increase your probability of a successful VBAC. Factors that increase her chance of a failed trilateral labor after cesarean include increased maternal age, non-white ethnicity, obesity, a recurrent indication for the initial cesarean delivery such as labor dystocia, increased neonatal birth weight, a gestational age greater than 40 weeks, preeclampsia, and a short interpregnancy interval. Ultimately, Labora and her healthcare provider should discuss and decide on a delivery plan that factors in her individual clinical factors, as well as the availability of a 24-hour blood bank, continuous electronic fetal monitoring, and other hospital factors such as in-house anesthesia that will enable an expedient cesarean delivery to be performed if necessary. This concludes the APCO video on abnormal labor. We have discussed the three P's to consider in evaluating labor, discussed fetal and maternal complications of abnormal labor, discussed oxytocin, and risks and benefits of trial of labor after cesarean, and discussed management of emergent obstetrical situations.